UCLA is a university with unlimited possibilities for students that desire world-class academics and research, unmatched diversity, incredible cultural and social opportunities, successful alumni and career networking, first-class campus facilities, plus America's top intercollegiate sports teams. Located in Westwood, just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean, UCLA's one square mile campus is surrounded by famous cities such as Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, and Santa Monica. Hi everybody and welcome to another edition of UCLA Bruin Talk. I'm Dave Marcus, she's Courtney Casso, we're your host and we're thrilled to have you with us. Before we speak to our first guest, let's take a look at this week's upcoming event. An outstanding regular season, domination of the regionals, and a very exciting trip to the Super Six culminated in UCLA's 105th team championship, the sixth for the women's gymnastics team, and two of the keys of that win are with us today. Anna Lee and Allison Taylor, congratulations and welcome to UCLA Bruin Talk. Thank you. <laughs> Anna, you started here as a freshman doing every event under the sun. You battled some injuries, but now as a senior, how gratifying to go out with your national championship. Uh, it was more than I could have ever imagined. And the whole year leading up to it, our team had seen what it was going to be like, and we visualized winning nationals. And when it actually happened, no one could believe it. Allison, watching the event, Every other team in the Super Six kind of showed some nerves. I looked at the Bruins' faces. It looked like no one doubted for a minute you were going to win. Yeah, we, I mean, we prepared well all year. We talk a lot about calm confidence on our team, going out, not being cocky, but being confident and knowing that we're going to hit. And we just decided before the meet that we were going to go out and have fun, and we knew that if we had fun, we were going to do our gymnastics, and it would pay off. Throughout the year, you guys were seen as top contenders for the national championship. Does that add a lot of pressure to you, or do you, like you say, it's just that calm confidence and you don't even worry about what they say? Uh, well, this year we focused a lot on staying in our Bruin bubble, and that's what we called it. So we had no idea what the other teams looked like in championship season. Yeah. Like from Pac 10s, <laughs> we had no idea around the nation how everyone else was doing. Besides, after the competitions, they would tell us, like, you guys place the highest score out of everyone. And that happened after Pac-10 and regionals and Super 6. And we had no idea what the other teams looked like. Your coach, Miss Val, was saying that. There were times where she didn't even know what scores you guys got. Yeah. It just was, how did you perform? And so scores weren't really something you worried about. Uh, no, because we couldn't, you can't control the scores. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you have control of is what you're doing and what you're capable of doing and preparing to the best of your capability. So, even after nationals, we had no idea what the scores were. We didn't even know if we actually won. <laughs> we just know that we hit to the best of our capability, so we already felt like we won. Yeah, what was interesting too was when nationals aired um, on TV a few weeks later, I was watching it with some of the team, and everyone was like, we didn't even know what color anyone's leotards were. We had no idea that everyone was so nervous on beam except for us, and 
it was kind of nice to know that we were so in the zone and in our own team that we literally had no idea what anyone else was doing. So what you're saying is the Bruin bubble is being clueless. I've been doing that for years. <laughs> um, your coach, you mentioned, we mentioned Ms. Val a minute ago, but Valerie Condos Field uh, just this week announced nominated to the UCLA Hall of Fame. How does that make you feel as one of her competitors? Um, I mean, it's an, it's an amazing accomplishment for her, and she definitely deserves it more than anyone I can imagine. You know, six national championships and all, everything that she's done with this program is just exceptional. And she definitely deserves it. We were all emotional about it. And it's just a great accomplishment. And she, yeah, so. Anna, we, we mentioned uh, you finishing your career out at UCLA. You are so entwined with Pauley Pavilion. The story has been often told that your parents who competed for China in 1984 in the Olympic Games in Pauley Pavilion, mm -hmm. then you end up spending a brilliant career here. And then at the groundbreaking for the Pauley renovation, you really were one of the faces of the UCLA community as you were part of the groundbreaking. Tell us about that experience. Um, I was actually on my way to nationals when I found out that they had requested me to speak for the groundbreaking. And I was like, wait, isn't that a big deal? I was like, the groundbreaking? <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoa. So it was really great. Like, it was a great opportunity to be able to represent all the students at UCLA. and. The fact that I had the opportunity to compete in there for four years and the same place that my parents competed, it was just, it was amazing. On that same note, when you came for your official visit, that was the first time your mom had been back in Poly Pavilion, right? Right. What was that like for your parents to come back to the place where now their daughter is going to compete and where they competed for the, the right. country? Uh, well, I had no idea that that was where they actually competed. I remember growing up and telling everyone, oh, my parents competed in Los Angeles in the 84 Olympics. And then on my recruiting trip, my mom got teary-eyed, and I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> I was like, why is she crying? <laughs> but um, that's when I found out that that's where, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's really emotional. And for my very first competition, they both came out and watched, and it was really exciting. She was probably crying because the building looked exactly the same. That's why they're doing the <laughs> renovation. <laughs> and now she's crying happy tears. <laughs> Allison, your specialty was the bars, the uneven mm -hmm. bars, and you have moved into floor exercise. Yeah. Now we've heard there's a move called the Al Slide. Oh, goodness. Tell us all about that. Well, it kind of originated randomly. Um, we had a guy from a gymnastics website come in and shoot some footage um, when we were preparing to get ready to open the season with Utah. And he was just filming our workouts. and. I had just tried this new conditioning thing probably a week prior to him coming and no one else on the team could do it so it was a big deal everyone was trying to trying to see if they could do it so um, yeah it was pretty exciting it turned into a big thing on this website they they called it the Al Slide Challenge and people were sending in videos of them trying to <laughs> perform it um, I like to think that I can do it better than anyone since it is named after me but People were doing their best. <laughs> it doesn't have the same ring as Yurchenko, but it sounds pretty good. I, I think it could go in the code of points myself, but <laughs> you never know. Now, you mentioned the, the meet against Utah. You guys faced great competition. You may have been in the bubble, but you knew where you were traveling and who you were competing against. You went to Georgia this year. Right. I mean, you, you, you faced the best. Yeah. Ultimately, what did that do to raise the performance level of this team? It's, it was definitely a confidence booster. After the season opener with Utah, we performed really well. Uh, we watched the film the next week, and after watching the film, we felt like we had already won nationals. Everyone looked around and said, you know, we kind of feel like we just won. So it was a great confidence booster from right from the get-go, and we had some bumps along the road, but we definitely learned from them. And I think that the losses that we had to Stanford um, really had the biggest impact because it drew our team together. We decided what kind of team we wanted to be, who, what our identity was going to be as a team, and it was just us, the girls, uh, without the coaches. So we really were accountable for each other and that was what paid off in the end. Touching on that, something Ms. Val said and then I heard you say in your senior speech, it's all about a choice when you wake up in the morning. So tell me a little bit about that. Tell everyone about that choice that you've made. Uh, well, I struggled a lot the first three years of understanding what she was trying to teach me. Um, just the fact that life's a choice and you have the opportunity to choose to be happy and like design the life you want to live and I struggled with understanding that concept and I thought I was unhappy and everything but in the end nothing had changed I'd still gone to the same school I was still at the same gym with the same coaches same schedule and just changing your mentality and 
deciding what kind of life you want to live was something that I decided and finally understood before my senior year. And that's something that sounds pretty simple, but in practice, it's, it's really hard to do. Like you said, nothing changed, but you had to change, and it right. had to come from within. Right, and she, Ms. Val actually pulled me to the side at regionals after I got my second perfect 10 on the uneven bars, and it was right we'll in the We'll just gloss over that real quick, <laughs> no my big second deal. perfect 10. <laughs> right in the middle of competition, and she pulled me to the side, and every all the fans were cheering, and it was just an amazing feeling, and I was really excited, and she pulls me to the side and tells me, you know, your perfect 10 doesn't matter. And I was like, oh, okay. And she's like, yeah, like the crowd doesn't matter. The score doesn't matter. You're wearing a pretty leotard. That doesn't matter. And she's like, what matters is that you're already a champion. That's how you trained all year consistently. And that was a I big... I think I would have cried. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was in the middle of the competition. So I was like, oh my gosh. And it was very exciting to realize that I had actually changed the way I viewed my life. You'd already won. Right. Of course, when they make the movie, she's going to say, perfect 10 doesn't matter, but an 8.25 does matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've competed at UCLA. You've had a brilliant career, national championship. Can't go out on a better note. What next? What are you doing, Anna? Um, I'm finishing school, staying out in LA. Uh, all my friends are here. So I want to get into broadcasting, maybe try some Cirque. Well, congratulations. Thank I you. mean, you can't go out better. It was a brilliant career. <laughs> We've loved having you here. <laughs> Absolutely. You. Allison, um, you're coming back, of course. Yes. Um, now, you've overcome some injuries, too. You had a foot injury that you had to, to work to overcome. Yeah. One of the interesting things about college gymnastics, there's no other sport where athletes have such an intense level of training and competition before they get to college. Yeah. And this is really the cap on a lot of careers. Mm -hmm. the what, thing, what keeps you going when you have an injury like that? Uh, you know, I mean, like Anna said, we all have a serious passion for the sport, or we wouldn't still be here and competing at the collegiate level because you know, I know I've been doing gymnastics for almost 19 years now, so to be able to keep yourself pushing through injuries and obstacles and frustration is, is a, it's challenging, but it's completely worth it because in the end, you know, it, it pays off with going to college and competing with a team or winning a national championship. And that's the desire to compete and the desire to win is what drives most athletes. And I think gymnasts are actually a little bit above everybody else. For some reason, we seem to have this competitive fire that refuses to die no matter what. So you guys have summer coming up, and this is a time where it's kind of on your own, meaning Miss Val's not going to be there to watch you every day and make sure you're... So tell me what you're going to do training-wise, and how does Miss Val keep tabs on you to make sure you're doing what you need to be doing? <laughs> Miss Val's always keeping tabs I'm on sure. us. <laughs> no matter what. Um, yeah, she, I mean, she's always sending us text messages, emails, letting us know to update her on what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm here all summer for summer school, training with the coaches. You know, we're, we're free to go home for the entire summer if we would like, but it's really difficult to go home and train by yourself mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. training with the team and having the motivation of them behind you. So it's, I, for me, it's really important to stay out here and train with my current coaches and train in my gym that I'm comfortable with and the girls that I'm comfortable with. I think that attitude right there is why you guys are so <laughs> such a good team because so many people say, I do want to just go home. You know what's best for you as an athlete in academics. So yeah, pretty wonderful. <laughs> Anna, your parents, of course, coached you when you mm -hmm. were younger. Uh, what were their reactions on, on your career in college, having to kind of give up a little bit of the control to Ms. Val? Uh, how did that work? Uh, well, they, they were probably excited because we kind of bumped heads a lot growing <laughs> up since they were my parents and my coaches. But they're more than excited that the career that I've had here at UCLA and basically just everything was a dream come true. Just having the opportunity to be at UCLA for education and coming out with a national championship ring my <laughs> last year is, there's no better way to end it. A dream come true ends with a banner. UCLA's 105th. Congratulations to both of you. Thanks for joining us on UCLA Bruin Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. In a moment, we're going to meet with another program. This one's really on the rise. They went somewhere they've never gone before. We'll find out more after this brief public service announcement. A trophy can be made just about anywhere. But there's one place where champions are made. UCLA, champions meet here. 
Hi, and welcome back to UCLA Bruin Talk. Before we speak to our next guest, let's take a look at our Bruin Athlete of the Week, Samantha Camuso. This week, we honor Samantha Camuso of the UCLA softball team as our Student Athlete of the Week. In competition against Louisiana Lafayette, she batted two home runs to give UCLA a 10-2 five-inning victory. The Bruins' 19th Mercy Rule win allows the team to continue on to the Women's College World Series. Camuso was also individually selected as a Muscle Milk Athlete of the Week for her competitive play at the NCAA Regionals. She had four RBIs and a three-run homer in the opener against St. Mary's and wrapped up the weekend against San Diego with a home run in the second inning on Saturday and a two-run homer on Sunday. The Bruins' sweep at Regionals brings the team to an overall season record of 45-11 and 11 and 24th appearance at the College World Series. Congratulations, Samantha, and good luck to the rest of the UCLA softball team. If you'd like any additional information on our teams or the UCLA softball team, please check out the website at www.uclabruins.com. So softball, 24th trip to the championship round, and another UCLA sport, a young sport, went this year for the first time to the NCAA championships. It's UCLA rowing, and we're very pleased to have a couple of the members of the team with us. It's great to see it, uh, Britta Severson and Lauren Counter. Congratulations, that's a great achievement, getting to the championships. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Britta, tell us as a freshman, I mean, this is all new to you, but yep. <laughs> what did it feel like getting all the way to the, to the final? It was wow. awesome. Just like after pack 10s and placing fourth in the pack 10s, like we kind of knew that we were going to go, and it was just like so exciting, like something so new, you know? It was like the top level of competition. Lauren, you have been here a while, and you've kind of, <laughs> you've kind of grown with the program. Mm -hmm. And to see this program, a new program on campus, get to that level, was this on schedule? Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's a really great way to go out. I'm glad I got to experience this before I graduated. It's, it's bittersweet, because I know that the team is going to do really well next year, too. And I'm sad that I have to like leave right as it's really rising. For someone like me who I don't know the intricacies of rowing and how, I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I saw, so there's a petite final, there's eight boats, there's four boats. Just explain to me a little bit what it means to the process of going into NCAA championships and how many boats you send. Lauren, okay. why don't you explain it? Well, um, to get to NCAAs, you have to be selected by the national committee. Um, they select you based on performances throughout the year, you know, big races like Crew Classic in San Diego, and especially Pac-10s. Pac-10s, how you place as a team, makes a really, has a really big impact on whether you get selected. Um, there's a weekly team ranking, which also uh, has a pretty big impact. But um, so in terms of finals, um, when you go to nationals, you race minimum three times, mm -hmm. maximum four times. Okay. Um, so you go in your heat, and then if you make the top three qualifying, then that would take you right to the semifinal. If you don't make that, then it's the repechage, which if you qualify that, then you can go to the semifinal. Now and the repechage, what is that? It's, um, it's for the teams that don't immediately qualify into the semifinal. It's like a second chance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> and then from the semi, you can go to the grand, or you can go to the second final, which would be the petite final. And then there's also the third final, which is the rest of the team. <laughs> and, and you finished third in the petite final. I mean, that's a great finish. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's really exciting. It, we, the varsity got ninth, so top 10, which is it's really cool. Oh, it's huge. You yeah. guys have experienced so much success this year, and like you said, in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. right. Britta, you are from Minneapolis, from Minnesota, right. and coming out to California, um, I'm sure it's different rowing on the Marina Channel yep. as opposed to <laughs> rowing on a lake back home. Yep. <laughs> um, and you're about, what, six foot? Yep. Basketball, volleyball player, like every young girl in Minnesota. Yep. <laughs> uh, how does it work? What, how do you know if you're going to go into an eight or into a four? How is that determined? Um, well, there's kind of like a ranking system among the boats. Like, there's the top, the V8, and then the Varsity 8, and then the, the second Varsity 8, and then the 4. So you're placed in those boats, like, according to your level. And is that at. determined on the water, on the erg machines? Both. It's a mixture of both. It's your technique and your power on the erg. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Lauren, you've spent plenty of time, I'm sure, on the ERG. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the difference between being on the on the ERG, on the rowing machine, and actually getting out on the water. Um, well, I mean, the ERG is an integral part of any uh, training program for rowing. Uh, it allows you to practice. I mean, most teams on the East Coast spend the majority of their training program on the ERG because they can't even go on the water because it's frozen. So um, it's really important, but I mean, I obviously, like I, rowing is way more fun. <laughs> you're actually going somewhere. Um, but the erg, the thing about the erg is that you can see exactly how hard you're pulling. So it's, more, it's a lot more individual, whereas when you're on the boat, it's a lot more of a team thing. Let's talk a little bit about Marina del Rey, where your home base is for UCLA. What are the challenges of, of rowing in the Marina Channel? Does it get choppy? Uh, sometimes, yeah. It can get choppy. Uh, you can sometimes get waked by big power boats. <laughs> Uh, after it rains, it's not the cleanest place. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Now, you say uh, that one of the great things, of course, is that you're going somewhere. How aware are you of where you're going when you're, when you're going? Well, in a, two, a 2K race, uh, you're very aware because um, there's very specific moves you make in specific places. Uh, we had one thing we really used this year, I think, that kind of helped us push through was we decided to take a move at the 650 meters in. Um, so that's kind of, you know, just after the start, you've exhausted all of your immediate energy, and now you have to kind of find this new place. So this is how, like, a minute and a half in. Yeah, about. Um, and then the 1,000 meters, everyone will take a move at the 1,000 meters, and then you get to a point, like, 300 meters left, and then you have to sprint it all out when you're already dying. <laughs> so I mean, you're really, really aware, and the coxswain makes you really aware as well. Well, that's my question. Britta, does, is it the coxswain giving you the, inf I mean, you're not looking around to the side, no. are you? you? You're relying on the coxswain exactly. to give you all that sort of information? Yep, when I am at the start, I wear a hat, and I like curl it, and I pull it down so I can only see in front of me. And she tells us where we are about, I don't know, like every 200 meters, she'll say something. Mm -hmm. what, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on her or on the back of the rower in the front of you? The back of the rower in front of me. I'm just like staring at it. <laughs> Do you, I mean, I imagine, I mean, you've got to be in a synchronized rhythm to really have success right. as a team. Are you watching her back to figure out the pace? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Remarkable. You, yeah, you just watch her back and you, sometimes you like glance out at her oar to make sure that the timing is right. And, so Britta, I be, I'm going to ask you because you're a freshman and you're just new to this crazy rigorous right. schedule of being a rower. Right. Being an athlete's tough enough, but how have you been able to acclimate to the early mornings and the off campus and handling academics and then trying to have some fun too? Right. <laughs> it was definitely a shock the first couple of weeks when I started waking up at 5.30 every morning. It was kind of a shock to the system, but then you just kind of get in a routine and like 5.30 doesn't seem early anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you do get those days to sleep in, at like let's say on Saturdays our practice was at seven instead of six, and like that extra hour is amazing. So like <laughs> even sleeping in, like it almost helped because sleeping in just an extra hour was so amazing. And getting into that routine, I would imagine it probably helps you handle all the academics too. It's like like you looking down and having those blinders, you just kind of go with the flow and do your schedule. Yeah, exactly. Like you only have a certain amount of time to study, and I know I work best under like crunch time, so I feel like it's always kind of crunch time, and mm -hmm. it's just you got to sit down and do it. Lauren, you've been through it, and uh, your career as a rower here at UCLA comes to a close. What, what now? What next? Um, I want to travel, I guess. I haven't really had the opportunity. I've been rowing since high school, seven years, so um, there aren't a lot of opportunities for travel in that time period because you're always training. So um, I'm going to do that. I'm, I got accepted into the Peace Corps. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Wow. So I'm do you know where you're going to go? Somewhere in Latin America. They haven't told me exactly where yet. So I'm waiting on medical clearance for that. But uh, that's my future. Well, that's fantastic. Wow. Um, when you started rowing, you mentioned you've been doing it since high school. How did you make the decision to get into it? Think, hey, this may be a sport I want to pursue. Yeah, it's a family thing. I think you have to you kind of know someone who rows, and uh, that's mm -hmm. how you get into it. My cousin rode uh, when he went to Cal State Long Beach, and then my brother rode at Cal State Long Beach and then ended up coaching for Cal State Long Beach. And uh, I rode at the junior program in Long Beach and then came here. 
Britta, how about in Minnesota? Our, our, our visions of Minnesota are ice fishing. That's right. what you uh, How did you get involved in rowing? Um, my brother did it. There's actually a teacher at my school who was really into it, and um, he was my brother's Nordic skiing coach, and so he got my brother into it, and then I just followed after that. And when did somebody tell you, or did you realize, hey, I, I, you're really good? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I kind of have, like, the body type for a rower, and so whenever, when I started rowing, I was like, oh my god, you're going to be so good, and so I was like, why, you know? <laughs> but like, being tall and like having long legs is really helpful. And strong. Yeah. <laughs> You're a strong athlete. You've got tons of people on your roster. There's like 50 rowers on the roster. Right. Obviously, not all of them are in the boats in the competitions. How do you determine who's going in, who's going out? Is it, is it a, a competitive environment in practice? Oh, absolutely. Every day, every, we used to do erg tests every Wednesday, and that was one of the most stressful, but like mm -hmm. almost exciting like days of the week because like it was you're competing with your team you know because you don't usually get it when you're in the boat you're not really competing against your team mm -hmm. in your boat you know so like this is a chance to be competitive within your team how about the summertime what do you do to stay in shape um erg <laughs> and do like cross training like running and stuff now will you be here this summer or are you going back home i'm going to go back home and then i'll come back here in august for summer school now, on the team, like Dave said, you have such a large roster. And at UCLA, because it's a new sport, you guys have a lot of walk-ons, people that tried out as students. So I would imagine you have the experience level is all over the place. <laughs> now, do those more experienced rowers, are you guys kind of teaching your teammates as you go about the intricacies of your sport? It's a lot to pick up. It's a whole new yeah. language. Yeah. Um, but we have, when the walk-ons come in, we have a separate coach who teaches them how to row, teaches them the fundamentals, the basics. But um, the walk-ons have been such an integral part of our program. Definitely. I mean, last year we had so many injuries. We ended the year on a really tough note. But uh, if we didn't have those walk-ons, we couldn't have even had like, the full team competing at Pac-10s. And this year we had a uh, walk-on, Jessica. She ended up stroking our JV at uh, NCAAs. So I mean, nice. they some of them, really pick it up and do really well with it and they can really excel even by the end of the year. But What would you tell someone who may be in high school, maybe just starting high school, that has some in interest in the sport? How would you get involved? Uh, check out the local programs. There's a lot of yeah. local programs. I would tell them just to get in a boat because once you get in a boat, like, you just know that it's, like, it's an amazing feeling like having all eight people like, connect together like that. Well, it's been amazing watching the success of the Bruins. And Lauren, we we're so impressed with your Peace Corps mission. That is just uh, such yeah. a great <laughs> thing to do. And, and I can't wish you anything but the best for that. Thank you. How's your Spanish? Pretty good? I, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be I, better. I, I need to uh, practice. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. And I'm sure you know a lot about practice having been <laughs> It's true. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of UCLA Bruin Talk. Congratulations to the rowing team and to the gymnastics team for great seasons. We hope you'll be with us next time. We'll have another great show for you. For Courtney Casso, I'm Dave Marcus saying so long for UCLA Bruin Talk.